Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have King Henry VIII. We'll start off this list with some 1500s dating drama. I love it. The fourth wife of Henry VIII, Anne of Cleves, was married to King Henry for six months. It was seen as quite strategic, actually. See, Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's duke, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein, famous painter, travel all the way to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like ancient tinder. It's wild. This man compared portraits for a few days and then finally chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. He even compared her to a silver moon. I've never heard Taylor compare me to the silver moon, so it seems like he's gonna step his game up. So eventually a treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because when she arrived, she apparently looked nothing like the portrait. How horrible is that? It's 6 a.m., you just met your new husband after traveling upriver by barge, and the dude has the audacity to say you don't resemble a Victorian painting. Awesome. He even tried to stop the wedding, but it was too late at that point, so they had to follow through. Imagine still having to follow through. On January 6th, 1540, their marriage was official. But soon after, Anne gladly accepted the divorce, then lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Historians believe that it was cancer. In our number nine spot today, we have King James. Before I dive into this one, guys, don't forget to hit that thumbs up if you're enjoying the video. It does really help us out. Not to be confused with LeBron James, this is a different king. In an official 16th century medical book, the actual medical advice at one point was to not bathe. Quote, use not baths or stews, nor sweat too much, for all openeth the pores of a man's body, and maketh the venomous air to enter, and for to infect the blood. First of all, huh? Why is every shred of medical knowledge from the past always written in riddles? God forbid you have bronchitis in the 16th century, a doctor would be like, ah yes, just a drop of ale and a witch's flick, you'll be well on your way. Like, bro, I have pneumonia. Please help me. They thought that taking a bath would make you sick, so King James IV apparently just never took a bath. And his hygiene was so bad that he would sometimes pass on lice to others just by being in the same room as them. Even if he was in a room hours prior, Buddy would give you lice. Doesn't help that the guy had long hair. Guy's got Steven Tyler hair. It's like a lice lunchroom in here. Lice would emit off of this man. Margaret Tudor was married to King James the fourth that must have sucked so itchy in our number eight spot today we have King George the fifth when was the last time you saw a stamp I haven't seen a stamp in months but King George the fifth but he loved stamps maybe a bit too much it was taking many hours out of his days even when it shouldn't have been a priority at all King George the fifth continued to collect stamps during World War one everybody is trying to stay alive George is just licking stamps in the library adding him to collections. Like all collections, the king started at an early age, but in the end of his days, George had albums and albums and albums, so many stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. That's so many stamps. In 1905, George set an all-time stamp record. It was the most money ever spent on a stamp. The man dropped like 220,000 on one stamp. That's some Logan Paul shit. So naturally, he was nicknamed the King of Stamps, or rather, the King of Philady. That's the official term for collecting stamps. Some stamp jargon for ya. There you go, welcome to Bumblebee. We're learning, smash that thumbs up. In our number seven spot today, we have King Rudolf II. The Holy Roman Emperor from 1552, he was known as a collector. Some princes collect stamps, others collect zoo animals. A Little more badass if you ask me. His castle was home to lions, tigers, and orangutans, so good luck getting a full eight hours of sleep. He also collected human artifacts. So, yeah, it's a bit odd, isn't it? Imagine having company, don't step in lion crap, and also don't mind the jars of eyes. Cheers! King Rudolf II, he's quite important in history. He supported the scientific revolution quite a bit. He also poured tons of money into astrology, so he was into cool stuff too, besides the kidneys and kangaroo collections. In our number six spot today, we have King George IV. Voted as England's worst king by historians, let's do it. King George IV was too invested in his intimate conquests. He was focused on all the wrong stuff and he was also just horrible about it. This king tried everything to get 
a woman to sleep with him. He would throw tantrums if a crush wasn't interested, and sometimes he would threaten to end his own life if he didn't get their attention. Super creepy, because on top of the lengths he would go to just to get some time alone, he also kept some of their hair after the dirty deed was done. Yeah, he would ask everybody he slept with for a lock of their hair. Back then it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair. Just envelopes of hair. The collection was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa. This insane collection is now in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want to feel sick. In our number five spot today, we have Christian the Seventh. Christian. An ironic name for what I'm about to tell you. The young prince that couldn't keep his hands out of his pants. Let's mention him. Christian VII of Denmark, he was, as I said, a wee young lad. And of course, a wee bit spoiled. Very comfortable with his body though, I'll say. More often than not, he would just have his hands in his pants. Middle of dinner, passing food around to his family, alternating hands in the pants to hands on food. This should have been number one, now that I think of it. What a little it's unknown, but historians believe maybe he was a wee bit mad. Who's to tell? Either way, don't touch the rye bread, Christian. Thanks so much. In our number four spot today, we have King Henry VIII. Of course, we have to talk about Henry VIII. He's pretty bad. Henry VIII was the King of England from 1509 to 1547. He's been married a handful of times, and they all went south. When Henry married Catherine Howard, he was 49, and Catherine was a lot younger. Classic 1500 stuff. After the two were married, Henry was not the same as he was when they had met. He had since received a nasty jousting wound to the face, was gravely overweight, and never wanted to do anything with Catherine. So Catherine, of course, just wanting some shred of a life and being, again, quite young, decided to look for love. Well, God forbid. God forbid you try and have a life in the 1500s. The young queen was accused of having an affair and was publicly and horribly taken out in the courtyard. She was accused of cheating before they even got married and in turn lost her head. Horrible times. In our number three spot today, we have Don Carlos. Prince of Asturias in the mid 1500s, the Spanish prince who just enjoyed being the worst human alive. Back in the mid 1500s, the eldest son to King Philip II of Spain was a horrible person. Now, it's been noted that he was born Born with a hunchback and one leg was shorter. Historians like to bring that up first and how maybe he had the odds against him physically. That sucks on one hand, but it's how you deal with it and how you deal with others that shows what type of person you are, let alone leader. Don Carlos was made hero of the opera by his dad, Philip II of Spain, so right off the hop, easy promotion. All about who you know. Don Carlos would hurt people a lot. He would hurt animals for fun as well. As a true crime enthusiast, you know that's a red flag. According to historians, Don Carlos once made a cobbler eat a pair of boots because he didn't like how they looked. He made somebody eat a pair of boots. We're not going to feel bad for Don Carlos on Bumblebee today. No, sir. He was set up to marry Elizabeth of Valios, the eldest daughter of King Henry II. But after a few hours with the man, she decided there's absolutely no way in hell. So she married his father instead, King Philip, in 1560. In 1564, a few brides were lined up for Don Carlos, Mary, Queen of Scots, Margaret of Valios, and Anne of, of Austria. When Carlos was plotting to take out his own father, he was caught and imprisoned in solitary confinement until his death six months later. In our number two spot today, we have the personal sheet changer. I can't tell if this is the worst job to have or the best. Here we go. Royals have been sweating constantly about people trying to take them out. Taylor's mentioned Boy Jones on here a few times. That guy that stalked the queen. It's terrifying. People are terrifying. Boy Jones would go through the queen's drawers. Big ew. So historically, the royal family would try their best to anticipate an attack, be as safe as you can be. Like the kissing sheets, for example. Have you ever heard about this royal position? A great deal of monarchs hired taste testers to make sure nobody poisoned them, and they also had a guy get tucked in the king's sheets. I would much rather have the latter. King Henry VIII hired somebody to make sure his bed wasn't poisoned, so you were required to make the king's bed every morning. But you also had to rub all the sheets down before bedtime. 
them. You'd have to kiss the bed sheets to make sure that they weren't poisoned. Sleep tight, all safe here. Don't mind the bad breath on all of your pillows. You're safe though. All right, time to clock out for the day. Clothes as well, that was touched. Maybe not kissed, but for sure touched. Guys wearing my clothes in my bed, no way I'd rather get poisoned. Take my jeans off. In our number one spot today, we have King Louis the 14th. We gotta talk about perhaps one of the worst sights to see in the royal household. Back in the olden days, enemas were the talk of the town. Rather, the palace. Like most things in the 1400s, only the rich could afford the enema supplies, specifically King Louis the 14th. Guy loved enemas. It is believed that over the course of his life, Louis the 14th received thousands of enemas. In just one year, Louis received 212 enemas. He would always take it a step further, and dare I say a step fancier, by using almond milk. Imagine being married to a guy and he pulls out the almond milk. Like, not again, Louis, come on. I just ate, man. No. <laughs> Starting off this list in our number 10 spot, we have the Murdochs. With the high profile of this ongoing case, coupled with the fact that Netflix just released a chilling documentary about the story of this family, it is likely that you may already have quite the idea of who the Murdoch family is. Taylor and I have been watching the documentary series, we're past the first few episodes, and man is this story wild. A few years ago, if someone asked you who the Murdoch family was, you would have likely described them as one of the most powerful families in South Carolina, with a legal dynasty that has spanned for a century. Now, if I asked you that same question, the answer would be a family who had it all. Money, power, status, but some of the members flew a little too close to the sun, tragedy ensued, and now people have lost their lives and the family has been destroyed. It started back in 2015 with the death of Stephen Smith. It carries on to 2018 when Gloria Satterfield, a long-serving employee for the family, was found passed away after a quote, trip and fall accident. These events are both horrible and completely atrocious, but despite the rumors, mysteries, and alleged conspirators of these deaths, things really started to unravel for the family in February of 2019 with the death of Mallory Beach. The young woman met her untimely fate after a boating accident where, allegedly, 19-year-old Paul Murdoch was at the wheel, intoxicated. We could spend hours and hours talking about this family and all of these cases and the conspiracies, but we are short for time, which brings me right to the most recent tragedy. The 2021 killings of that same Murdoch who was driving the boat, as well as the killing of his mother, Margaret. Now, I do believe that people are innocent until proven guilty, but it is important important to note that the one on trial for these killings right now is the father and husband to the deceased, Alex Murdoch, the patriarch of the family who is supposed to be carrying on that Murdoch legacy. The stories surrounding this family are horrific, tragic, and a reminder of the dangers that money and power can bring. In our number 9 spot today we have the Sacklers. This family is the one behind the dynasty of Purdue Pharma who is best known for producing an exceptionally strong prescription painkiller. Of course, we all know just how big and rich a pharma pharmaceutical company could get, especially one that has been around for quite some time. The company was first created in 1952 by three Brooklyn-born brothers, and in the beginning, the company mostly dealt in things like laxatives and earwax removal methods. Soon, things for the company took quite an upwards turn, and before anyone knew it, the family was regarded as one of the most esteemed New York families, but they were also known for their philanthropic tendencies, with their names on museums and hospitals, some of the most famous in the world. You see, the thing is, when they released this painkiller in 1995, it led to them amassing an insane $13 billion fortune. That is obviously incredible, but the trouble came when it was realized that this painkiller wasn't nearly as potent as it was marketed to be, and frequent users would be building up a tolerance to it, meaning they needed to use higher and higher dosages. Viewer, welcome to the opioid crisis. Basically, this all spiraled out of control and led to many, many lawsuits coming against Purdue Pharma. Not only by individuals, but by January 2019, 36 states were suing the company for what the painkiller had done to their citizens. After two years of deliberations, the Sacklers finally reached a deal with plaintiffs in bankruptcy court in September of 2021. As part of their Chapter 11 proposal, they agreed to pay $4.5 billion and give up all ownership of the company in exchange for complete immunity and all 
future opioid liability. Despite this fall from grace, the Sacklers were able to move an alleged $1.36 billion into offshore accounts, so despite their bankruptcy filing and the large sum of money handed over, they will continue to retain quite a large amount of their personal wealth. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Bakers. Jim and Tammy Faye Baker were once the most famous televangelists in America, and they certainly were living in quite a lap of luxury. They had beautiful homes, expensive cars, and a ton of money, but that quickly came crashing down amid horrendous scandal. In the late 1980s, after much success, Jim Baker resigned from the PTL ministry after there was a cover-up to hide some hush money that had been given to church secretary Jessica Hahn over an alleged essay situation. Of course, not necessarily a surprise, but definitely not a good look for a televangelist. This led to more interest in people looking into the family more, and soon it was uncovered that there was some sort of accounting fraud going on as well. The consequences for this came by way of felony charges, conviction, imprisonment, and divorce. That was the end of that legacy, but since serving his time, Jim Baker hasn't exactly slowed down. He not only remarried and returned to televangelism, but he also currently hosts The Jim Baker Show, which focuses on the end times and the second coming of Christ while promoting emergency survival products. So. That's interesting. In our number 7 spot today, we have Prince Sado. Born in 1735, Prince Sado was the heir to the Korean throne, but unfortunately, he would go on to suffer from extreme mental illness and delusions. Thankfully for historians and those of us interested in history, the wife of the prince created memoirs, and in them, she detailed the horrifying things that happened next. The prince began to kill. He began to hurt and torment people. He basically turned their home into a house of horrors. The prince also endured some pretty horrific treatment from his own father, which of course is not an excuse for the things he did, but it definitely did not help the scenario. Eventually, the family had enough and realized that his behavior would go on to ruin the name of their family forever, so something needed to be done. At the time, tradition stated that if the prince were to be executed, his wife and child would also need to be, but everyone thought that maybe that was a bit too far. Why should they have to pay for his crimes? This led to the king coming up with quite the bizarre workaround for this. On a hot day in July, the king forced the prince to step into a rice chest, which was then locked behind him. This acted as a way to make it seem like he had caused his own death, which is said to have occurred just a few days later. In our number 6 spot today, we have Don Carlos. This little troublemaker never made it to the title of king, but he sure was a little too close for comfort when you hear about the kinds of things he was doing. Carlos was the prince of Asturias, in the mid-1500s, as he was the eldest son of King Philip II of Spain. It is said that Carlos may have had some troubles right from birth, which many believe could be due to inbreeding that was common in the family at the time. Descriptions of his behaviors, though, are far worse than what anyone could have expected. It is said that Carlos did horrible things, like hurting or taking the lives of animals for fun. Nowadays, we call that a huge warning sign for potential killers. Back then, it was like, I don't know. Was anybody even watching you, really? It is even said that at one point he purposefully blinded all of the horses in the royal stable. Soon, of course, his cruelties would extend to humans, with people claiming that one time he chose to harm a servant girl for no reason other than because he could. Major King Joffrey vibes in that one. And apparently one time he made a shoemaker eat a pair of shoes that he had made that the prince didn't like. He was just a little twerp. Carlos was set up by his family to marry the eldest daughter of King Henry II, but after a few hours with the man, she decided that there was absolutely no way in hell. Like, he was so bad that she would rather marry his dad. Which she did, in 1560. In the end, Carlos was found to be plotting to take out his own father, which landed him in prison in solitary confinement where he passed away six months later. In our number 5 spot today, we have Prince John. It is said that this may be one of the darkest secrets of the British royal family. Prince John would have been the uncle of Queen Elizabeth II, but he passed before she was born. Prince John was the sixth child of King George V and Queen Mary, and it is said that he suffered from seizures, likely as a result of epilepsy, although though it's hard to diagnose for certain because of all of the secrecies surrounding him and his illness. From the age of four, when he had his first seizure until his untimely and very early death, Prince John lived in a separate estate where he was cared for by a governess. Many people have since criticized the royal family, calling their treatment of Prince John as callous or inhumane, like they were hiding him away for being ill. Of course, the palace was concerned with the monarchy's public image, and there was a belief at the time that royals shouldn't have any physical or mental ailments, although 
that is of course impossible. They also didn't include him in public events, which could have been another image thing, and also perhaps because of a worry that he might have a seizure at one of these events. At the end of the day, it was definitely a different time, but the idea of excluding him because he was ill truly is a really sad thought. In our number 4 spot today, we have Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy. This is a royal scandal that took place all the way back in 1314, and it starts off with the daughters-in-law of King Philip IV of France. I think that's the fourth. Here's hoping. These young women, Marguerite and Blanche of Burgundy, were accused of having quite a scandalous affair with two brothers, Philippe and Gautier. So this already is some hot tea, but apparently when Queen Isabella of England, who is the daughter of King Philip of France, so I guess like sister in law with these ladies, when she heard these stories, apparently she's the one who totally outed their affairs. It was obviously a huge deal, and both of the women admitted to their adultery. This led to them being pretty much erased from public knowledge. They had their hair cut short, and they were thrown in a dungeon. And even though Marguerite was meant to be the queen of France through her marriage, when her husband ascended the throne, she stayed locked in the dungeon until the marriage could be annulled. Little is known about what happened to either of them after this point. However, it is believed that Marguerite passed away in 1315 and Blanche 1326. As for the men in this affair, well, they met quite a gruesome fate that involved the removal of their bits and pieces before their swift execution. In our number 3 spot today, we have the Duggars. Alright, one of the most famous reality TV families, and even before the horrors of this family came to light, they were already a family that had fame due to quite a strange reason. If you're unfamiliar with who the Duggars are, you might be more familiar with the show that they used to have on TLC titled 19 Kids and Counting. Yeah, the show ran on TLC for seven years until it was cancelled in 2015, and the show featured, well, the Duggar family. The family consisted of parents Jim Bob and Michelle Duggar and their 19 children, 9 daughters and 10 sons, all of whose names begin with the letter J. It was an interesting time, and they seemed like this huge, happy, religious family. But in the years since the cancellation of the show, some horrifying things came to light. Initially, the reason that TLC suspended and then subsequently cancelled the show is because it came to light that the eldest son in the family, Josh, had done some horrible things and acted violently, horrendously, and inexcusably against a number of girls, even some in his own family. Due to the popularity of the show, before these serious stories came to light, there was a spin-off show that was created titled Counting On. This show first aired in December 2015 and stayed on the air for a surprising number of years before it was pulled, and the family yet again found themselves in the center of a scandal that had to do with Josh. This time he was caught in possession of a certain kind of tape that no one should have, and that should not even exist at all. I can't say which kind of tape, but just know it's the worst of the worst. These are, of course, some of the worst scandals that have surrounded the family, but truly, it's only a drop in the bucket of the many stories surrounding them. In our number 2 spot today, we have King Juan Carlos. The former King Juan Carlos of Spain, when he first ascended the throne in 1975, was highly looked upon. He was said to be bringing a new age for the country, an age of democracy. His reign lasted for quite a while, but by the time 2014 rolled around, he was forced to abdicate the throne. This was due to a few reasons. Firstly, his public ratings started to plummet after word spread of him being a bit of a womanizer and after an explosive affair, but also because of a lavish elephant hunting trip he took in the middle of an economic collapse. Okay. Fair enough, I can see why people were getting their guard up a bit. So the king abdicated the throne in favor of his son Philippe, who sits on it to this day. During this time, however, the scandals in the family weren't only to do with Juan Carlos. In January of 2014, another of his children, his daughter Infanta Cristina, was charged with tax fraud. She has since been acquitted, that happened in 2017, but she was stripped of her title as the Duchess of Palma de Mallorca, and this whole deal had her leaving Spain and moving to Switzerland. The drama doesn't end here, however, because her husband husband actually was convicted in the case with charges that included embezzlement, fraud, and tax evasion, and he received prison time in 2018. In the end, none of the fraud charges have ever been linked back to the former king, but this entire debacle did cause the former ruler to move out of Spain. With his move came a letter, part of which read, quote, Guided by the conviction to perform the best service to the Spanish people, their institutions, and you as king, I am communicating my thoughtful decision to move at this time outside of Spain. 
a decision I make with sadness but with great serenity. I have been king of Spain for almost 40 years and during all of them I have always wanted the best for Spain and for the crown. In our number one spot today we have the Rothschilds. This family is easily one of the most, if not the most powerful family in the modern era. In fact, it is said that most of us in the western world don't even realize the impact this family has had on our lives, as our consumer driven lifestyle is definitely directly related to the monetary systems this family put in place. This would include the United States Federal Reserve. Because of this insane amount of money and power that this family has held for over a century, there are plenty of conspiracy theories going on surrounding them. The conspiracies run deep. and they they go quite dark. They touch on everything from assassination attempts, some successfully completed on sitting presidents, to heinous World War II agendas that would have benefited the family. Of course, they are conspiracies, so no one is quite sure which of these secrets, if any, are true. Even still, the stories and speculation swirl today, waiting for some piece of evidence to maybe bring them to light. Number 10, the Kennedys. For the older folks at home, this is going to be no surprise, but for the younger audience such as myself, let me explain. The Kennedys were a wealthy and powerful family in the US, a lot of their scandals originating from organized crime, American politics, and some juicy rumors. The most famous Kennedy being JFK. My generation knows him from Call of Duty Black Ops 1. Remember 5? It was, good, it was a good zombies map. The older generation remembers him for that one Sunday car trip in Dallas. You know what I'm talking about. He may have also been shacking up with Marilyn Monroe. His father was a bootlegger during the Prohibition era and his family seems to have a lot of plane crashes for some reason. I'm not sure why. The Kennedys are textbook scandalous and will be talked about for a long time to come. Number 9. The Jacksons As much as I love fame and fortune and baby, Chetty's all about that. I wanted to be famous ever since I was a tubby kid and I'm slowly getting there too. Nice. I don't think I'll ever reach the same level as Michael Jackson. Seriously, I wouldn't be surprised if the first aliens that we meet know the moonwalk. Not because they're from outer space, but because the reach of Michael Jackson knows no bounds. Starting with the Jackson 5 in the 70s and rising to stardom and becoming the biggest star of the 80s and 90s, in the 2000s too, growing up he was pretty popular. Multiple allegations of misconduct don't look good on anyone. Even for the king of pop though, he's, he, he's got a few things stacked against him. Number 8. The Trumps The billionaire extraordinaire turned POTUS is not shy from scandal. Now, I'm not talking about during his presidency either, I ain't gonna touch that. Some younger folks may not remember Donald Trump from the 80s and 90s, where he was arguably more famous. After getting a small loan of a million dollars, built his real estate empire and perhaps broke a few laws and or using legal loopholes to get what he wanted. I mean, can you really trust the guy that slaps his name on everything? Trump Hotel, Trump Airlines, Trump Board Game. And that's just him I guess. Number 7. The Rockefeller Donald Trump might have been a billionaire or the most famous billionaire, but I still think J.D. Rockefeller takes the cake. And his family, actually. A little history lesson here. Rockefeller, in a nutshell, was the first modern billionaire. Bruce Wayne, Tony Stark levels of wealth. Seriously, he was pretty rich. When oil and gas became big business in the late 1880s because industrial revolution, cars, we need oil, his company Standard Oil slowly rose up until they had a monopoly on the oil industry. By cutting out middle and cornering the market, he amassed billions. Today, adjusted for inflation, his pockets were lined with a very healthy $23 billion. Say it again, $23 billion. That was all the way back then. Way before Elon Musk, Bill Gates, and Buffett did it. I wouldn't mind $23 billion myself. Sounds good, right? Oh, all the McDonald's I could have. Oh, yeah. Number six, the Coppolas. Imagine being a not so well known director, then Marlon Brando walks in the room and goes, Let's make a movie. The Godfather, great movie, right? Well, it seems that filmmaking runs in the family. Awesome. A whole family of people involved in film. You gotta love that. I love film, that's awesome. However, for those fans of The Godfather, which if you haven't seen it, please do, it's, it's a masterpiece, go see it. What's not a masterpiece, however, is The Godfather 3. You can skip that one. I can just imagine the look on people's faces when they thought they were going to see a trilogy completed masterfully. It's a real stinker, folks, for many reasons, but a big one is Sofia Coppola, who plays Michael Corleone's daughter in the movie, which in real life is Francis Ford Coppola's daughter, the director of the movie. Imagine taking one of the best movie licenses of all time and almost single-handedly ruining that. 
Sorry, Dad. Number five, the Kardashians. Everybody knows the Kardashians. Everybody and everyone knows that they've had tons of scandals. Kim Kardashian being married to Kanye West is just scandal by proxy. Come on, come on that guy's crazy. She also had a tape that got out. Not, not her best moment. Mr. Kardashian was a lawyer on the O.J. Simpson case where he may or may not have done it. And of course, Kris Jenner married Bruce Jenner and who's now the fabulous Caitlyn Jenner and her daughter was in a weird Pepsi commercial this one time and this whole list could be about them, honestly. Strangely enough, for people who generally don't have talent in Hollywood, they sure get a lot of press. Which at some point is annoying, I'm sure. But be nice, paparazzi, or no Christmas presents. I know Santa Claus. And I'm, I'm, I'm keeping a list. It's early, but I'm keeping a list this year. Number four, the Queen. Being the Queen of England is hard, or so I'm told. I mean, it must be kind of nice to sit in a big palace all day eating cucumber sandwiches and getting lost in such a big place. I, I know I would. I, I would get lost for sure. The royal family, however, are no saints and have their fair share of scandals. Prince Andrew has gotten himself into some trouble in recent tabloids. But for some who don't know, Prince Harry was quite the wild child 20 years ago. A prince on the loose, if you will. Not to mention the whole debacle with Princess Diana. The car accident is a little sus, not gonna lie. Even way back in the day when both world wars were on, there was some minor cover up to hide the family's German heritage. Kinda hard to fight the Germans when your queens are one of the German. it just doesn't make a lot of sense. As long as there's a crown, there's always gonna be scandal. Number 3, Wally World. That's what my family calls Walmart. I don't know, that's just what we call it. The Walmart family is quite wealthy and tied to the Walmart Corporation, of course. And if you didn't know, Walmart doesn't have a squeaky clean track record. You mean a multi-billion dollar department store located in over 20 countries around the world hasn't been to every rule of law applied to them? <laughs> I'm shooketh. Not to diss Walmart, I love you guys. You got some good deals there, but there's no way anyone at home hasn't heard horror stories about working there. Come on, I know you're like, yeah, you're thinking about it right now, I know you are. On a more heinous note, Walmart's production methods are uncouth, as they use a version of labor I'm not allowed to say on YouTube. But in short, but in short their clothes are cheaply made and then sold at a huge markup. But because the production was so cheap, you can walk in there and buy a shirt for $15 and you feel like you saved, you feel good. Oh, there's a McDonald's, I'm gonna go there later. Nice, this is great, I love capitalism, it's the best. Number two, the Genovese. Probably the most infamous crime family to ever exist, or ask for protection money. One of the five families of New York, the Genovese family, were wise guys, good fellas, tough guys, made men, part of the crew, and like Don Rickles said once, probably sat around all day and smelling their guns. I love Don Rickles. It would be difficult to quantify everything the crime family had going for them. What separates the Italian mafia from everyday hoodlums is that they are organized, hence the name organized crime. Profiteering off anything they could really. Illicit substances, rackets, scams, gambling, and connections everywhere really. Watch The Irishman, it's on Netflix, it's a good movie. You'll know what I mean. Hey Frank, what do you want to do later Frank? Number one, The Clintons. Hillary, don't come in the room. Probably the grooviest president ever to hold office, Bill Clinton was president around the time I was born, so I'm not that familiar with his politics and policies. And when I think of the late 90s, I think of Nintendo 64, Tony Hawk, and MTV, so it would be difficult for me to talk about that in any way, really. Is the Clinton family a bunch of wealthy American leaders who have some ill-gotten gains and email deleters? Yes, most likely, but you all know why this is number one, don't you? Did you really think that me, Big Ched, Chetty, was going to talk about Clinton and not talk about his impeachment? Being one of only three presidents to have that process fully started. Interesting, I didn't know that. What were you guys thinking about? What were you talking about? There's nothing else he did wrong, right? He's, he's innocent, he's good. Who? Monica Lewinsky? Who's that? She did what with his what? Starting off in our number 10 spot, we have the movement for the restoration of the Ten Commandments of God. This cult with the catchiest name was founded in Uganda by four ex-Roman Catholic priests, two ex-nuns, and one former sex worker, and it was initially said to really emphasize the Ten Commandments. Apparently, these leaders thought that the Roman Catholic Church had really just abandoned the Ten Commandments, and they wanted to bring back some rules. They couldn't just focus on these rules, however, they also had to have some sort of doomsday process 
prophecy as well, like all good cults do. They claimed that the apocalypse would come on December 31st, 1999, and in anticipation of this, a bunch of the members sold all of their possessions, so of course, they were pretty irritated when the world in fact did not end. The leaders scrambled and instead altered their predictions, saying that the Virgin Mary would instead come on March 17th, 2000, and that she would bring them all to heaven. The followers continued to believe this, and on March 16th, they had a huge feast. The following day, on March 17th, police arrived to where the cult resided and found that an explosion and fire killed hundreds of members of the group. At first, they thought this could have been a voluntary event, but soon they saw the signs that pointed to this being a mass killing. The leaders likely took the lives of the followers because they could not pay them back, and they also knew that their quote unquote prophecies were false. At first, it was thought that the leaders were among those whose bodies were found, but that isn't quite the case. No one is exactly sure if they ended up losing their lives or if they instead fled the country, which many believe to be the case. At this point, there is still a warrant out for their arrest, so while the authorities have never officially confirmed that they are on the run, it truly is the most likely scenario. In our number 9 spot today, we have Om Shinrikyo. This cult was founded by a man named Shoko Asahara, and he claimed to be the reincarnation of the Hindu god Shiva. He said that he was destined to lead his followers to salvation once the apocalypse came, but then, once he lured in followers, he claimed he could also teach them to levitate and develop telepathic abilities. Apparently, those who were the most skeptical, he allowed them to drink his bath water. Not really seeing the connection on that one, to be totally honest, but those are just the facts. The cult continued to grow and drew in influential and wealthy people, and this is where things really took a turn for the worst. This group went on to attack Tokyo in 1994, which took the lives of seven people. Then, in 1995, they released gas into the Tokyo underground, which led to 12 deaths, 50 injured people, and more than 5,000 people with temporary vision problems. In the end, Asahara and 11 of his disciples ended up being arrested and charged for these crimes, and after standing trial, they were all sentenced to death in 2004. In our number 8 spot today, we have the Narco Satanists. Founded by a man named Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo, he was at one point a drug dealer and also the leader of a horrifying cult that was nicknamed the Narco Satanists by the media. Adolfo's followers believed that he had magical abilities, but in the worst way possible. He required his followers to kidnap young men who Adolfo would practice horrible, sadistic rituals on and ultimately take their lives in order to replenish this magic that didn't exist. It's an absolutely horrific story, and this carried on for years until the disappearance of Mark Kilroy. Mark was a Texas college student who was in Mexico for some fun over spring break in 1989, but sadly, during this trip, he was taken by the cult's followers. Mark's friends quickly noticed his disappearance and began searching for him, and this led to a border crossing manhunt, and authorities quickly revealed what had been going on, but Adolfo had already fled. He and four of his followers fled to Mexico City, and this is how he was finally caught. Police were called to the apartment they were staying at as a result of a totally unrelated dispute, but because Adolfo knew that they were looking for him, he just assumed that they were there for him, and he opened fire with a machine gun. Not wanting to go to prison, he then handed the weapon over to one of his followers and asked him to open fire on himself, and by the time the police were able to reach the apartment, he was already dead. In the end, 14 cult members were charged for their crimes relating to everything that went on. In our number 7 spot today, we have the Children of God. Karen Zerbe is the leader of the cult now known as the Family of Love, but is much better known by its former name, the Children of God. In 1969, Karen joined a group called Teens for Christ, and ended up becoming the personal secretary to David Berg, who is one of the founders of the group. Eventually, David would divorce his wife in order to marry Karen. Karen had a son named Ricky, and his childhood was made into a book which was used to show other members of the cult how they should raise their children, but the book included some pretty horrific and disturbing content. At first, Karen wasn't around or extremely active in the cult, but she began to insert herself more and more, and began making rules and enforcing discipline. Once David began to get sick in 1988, Karen took over the leadership position that she had been groomed for. After David passed away, she married another leader from the cult, and all the while, Karen was extremely elusive, so much so that some of the followers didn't even know what she looked like. This cult has actually seen a few celebrities over the years. Jeremy Spencer, who is one of the founding members of Fleetwood Mac, is a member of this cult. Joaquin Phoenix and his siblings were unfortunately subject to this terrible cult when they were growing up, but they all chose to leave later in life.
life and as adults have spoken out about it. Unfortunately, Karen is still active as the cult's leader, even though she most definitely should be in prison, and she still remains in hiding, living off of what money she could collect from followers. In our number 6 spot today, we have the Rajneesh movement. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh first became known in the 1960s as he traveled through India speaking out against socialism as well as aspects of mainstream religion. While speaking out about these things, he also advocated for a more open attitude when it came to human sexuality, and it's this stance that quickly earned him the nickname the sex guru. By the 1980s, he had taken his teachings to the United States where he opened a facility known as Rajneesh Param in Wasco County, Oregon, but this quickly upset the locals in the area. Not only were there legal battles surrounding his construction, but there were also crimes being committed by the followers of the Rajneesh movement. And we're talking about really serious crimes. There was a mass food poisoning attack with the salmonella bacteria, which marked the first known bioterrorism attack in the history of the United States. And if this wasn't bad enough, there was also the attempted assassination of United States Attorney Charles H. Turner. Rajneesh didn't take any responsibility for these crimes and instead blamed his personal secretary and her supporters, but despite this denial, he still found himself deported, after which he returned to India. Here he continued to run the Poon Ashram until his death in 1990. Honestly, the story is absolutely bonkers, the crimes are massive, and the entire thing is just very bizarre. In our number 5 spot today we have Nexium. This cult was founded by a man named Keith Rainier, and on the surface level they marketed this group as a multi-level marketing company, but instead it was definitely a cult and a front for disgusting crimes. Keith started off this multi-level marketing career with the company Amway, and by 1990 he had started his own, which ended up getting shut down for being a pyramid scheme. In 1998, Nexium was founded and was originally called a personal development company and was supposed to help with self-improvement. There was a 12-point mission statement which was recited during the cult classes where they purged themselves of all envy-based habits. There were different modules for classes like relationship sourcing which helped the members explore ways that they could financially benefit if their partner passed away suddenly, or another class where they only learned about psychopaths and their followers. Eventually, the cult leaders started to branch out and form different organizations related to the cult, and long story long, this cult was not for self-improvement, but was involved in some extremely terrible things. In 2018, Keith was arrested and charged, and in June of 2019, he was convicted for conspiracy and conspiracy to commit forced labor, as well as a few other really awful things, and all of these charges were related to Nexium. This story really blew up, especially due to the celebrity involvement of actor Allison Mack, who was also arrested for her involvement in the cult. In our number 4 spot today, we have the Manson family. Started by the horrible Charles Manson, this story starts off when Manson was released from prison in 1967, where he then moved to San Francisco where he gained a small following that would eventually go on to be the cult known as The Family. The group eventually moved to an abandoned ranch outside of Los Angeles, and it was here that Manson continued to brainwash his followers and manipulate them with, with his own religious philosophies. He is quoted as saying, quote, I'm God to my friends, I'm the devil to my enemies. When I look to the future, I'm the prophet. When I must lay down the law for our earth, I'm the son of man. Manson claimed that there would be an upcoming race war in which white people would be killed, which was intended to instill fear in his followers. This was so that he could ignite a race war and send his followers on a killing spree, which ended up being the night of the horrible Tate and LaBianca killings. This led to a reign of terror in the Los Angeles area for several months because people just couldn't understand how or why this happened. In our number 3 spot today we have Heaven's Gate. Started by Marshall Applewhite and his former partner Bonnie Nettles, the two founded the well-known cult Heaven's Gate. These two believed themselves to be something called walk-ins, which they said are higher beings who took control over the bodies of two middle-aged humans so as to spread their word and teach humanity. People who believed their story and were drawn in by the idea of these higher beings were of course being manipulated and taken advantage of, which is all too common in these cult stories and really is the basis for most of these kinds of stories. They gave up their lives and all worldly possessions in the belief that earth was to be recycled and the only way to continue surviving would be to leave immediately. The time to leave earth came in March of 1997 when Marshall claimed that they had a spacecraft that was traveling to the comet Hale-Bopp. The catch with this spacecraft however, well Marshall told them that they needed to stage all taking their own lives in order for the UFO to take them to another level of existence above humans. 39 members of this cult, including Marshall himself, took their lives over the course of the next few days. This was the largest event of this kind since the next point we're going to talk about, which brings me to number 2, the People's Temple Full Gospel Church. 
Jim Jones is certainly one of the most well known people on this list for all of the wrong reasons. He is the man who claimed that he was the reincarnation of Jesus, Buddha, and Gandhi, and he founded the cult, which was originally called Wings of Deliverance, but he later changed the name to the People's Temple Full Gospel Church. After an expose in the New West magazine about the things going on in this cult, he ended up moving the group from the United States to Guyana. From here, there were claims of horrible things and human rights violations, which led to an investigation. People found out that some of the supposed members of this cult were actually being held against their will. In the end, with all of this going on, Jim managed to convince his followers to all take their lives in one massive, horrible event, and this day has gone on to become known as the Jonestown Massacre. A total of 918 people died that day, including Jim. In our number one spot today, we have Synanon. What originally started out as a rehabilitation program founded by Charles Diedrich in 1958, things quickly changed and this began to turn into a sort of group that shared these truth-telling sessions. At first it was known as The Game before the 1970s when Sin Anon was officially born. The founder Charles, as he began to get some kind of power, he grew greedy and hungry for more. This led to him starting to charge insane fees for his members, as well as forcing the members to do extreme physical labor. This is all bad enough, but it gets worse. Anyone who tried to shut this little community down would be met with an attempted hit on their life. Charles developed a list for anyone who challenged Synanon, and this included a lawyer by the name of Paul Morantz, who actually almost died as a result of the hit that Charles had put on him. In 1991, Synanon finally met its end when it was shut down for tax fraud, destruction of evidence, and terrorism, and Charles passed away just six years later. Number 10, King Edward VIII. Directly after his father died in 1936, King Edward VIII took the throne, right? That's pretty normal. But the tides quickly turned when, less than a year later, he renounced his position. Now, this was of course a huge scandal, right off the bat. This is not something that's taken lightly in the royal family. Turns out the woman responsible for stealing his heart was that of Wallace Simpson, American socialite who had already been divorced once before and was at this point working through her second divorce. So you can only imagine how everybody reacted at that point, right? Oh, how dare she? His proposal to Simpson, of course, caused social and political backlash. The Church of England wasn't so chill with Edward marrying someone who had already been divorced. Yeah, they're not really okay with that. So Edward was forced to abdicate. Yeah, he had to, right, for love. Edward and Simpson then tied the knot in 1937, and they stayed together until Edward's death much later in 1972. Sliding into royal DMs right off the hop. Okay, we're in for a treat. Number nine, dark predictions. Of course, in recent years, the royal family has seen a change that many didn't really expect. When Harry and Meghan chose to renounce their royalty status, speculation began that this could be the beginning of the end for the monarchy. People only fueled their fire with questions and also, somebody may have called it. Yeah, not Stradamus. He may have predicted this entire event. One of his predictions literally reads, at the end of the war, the great powers change. Near the coast are born three beautiful children. They will ruin the town when they come of age, they will change the kingdom, and they will not see it grow anymore. Now, Harry is only one of two children, so I'm not sure if the, you know, quote was talking about him and his siblings, or if it has more to do so with some other royal family members, but either way, there's some people who take Nostradamus's words very, very seriously out there, so I had to include it. Maybe there's something there, I don't know. Maybe there's something we haven't quite breaking down yet. That's why we need National Treasure 3, you know? Maybe this is the plot. Number eight, King Henry II. While we're on the topic of him, could Nostradamus have actually predicted the death of King Henry II? Because if he did, that's pretty uh, that's pretty curious, I'd say. Never used the word curious in my life, but I'm like, you know what, that's curious. King Henry II was actually a personal acquaintance of the prophet himself. That'd be kind of cool, being friends with Nostradamus. I'd be like, hey, how does Game of Thrones end? Please. While at one point in history, Nostradamus was seen addressing King Henry II as the most invincible King Henry of France, unfortunately, Henry proved to be quite invincible when he met his gruesome death, might I add, at age 40. Yeah, in the summer of 1559, not a great time. A terrible jousting accident went wrong and left the king passing away shortly after from sepsis. This is a terrible story, but I have to explain because, you know, it's history. And well, that's what we're here for. The jousting accident saw the king having splinters driven into his eye and then his skull as well by one of his young soldiers. And the Nostradamus quote reads, the young lion will overcome the older one. It says he will pierce his eyes through a golden cage. Okay, already we're a little bit spooky. And that two wounds will ensure a cruel death. So I'm not saying he predicted it, I'm just saying, 
kind of nailed it. Number seven, a fateful turn of events. Queen Victoria, her reign began back in 1837 and it lasted until the queen's death in 1901. Now at just age 18, Alexandrina Victoria had to rise up to the throne. Had to, right? All these cases, it's like, yeah, they have to do this. She was born, of course, on May 24th, 1819, and Queen Victoria was actually fifth in line when she was born, nowhere near the throne. So right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely that she would ever see the crown. But one by one, all of her family members began passing away fast. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed away, and then her father and her grandfather both died one week apart from one another. So. On one hand, obviously it's sad, it's tragic, everyone's dealing with loss so fast. But on the other hand, by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next up to bat for the throne at 11. You imagine? That's like some ancient Egypt. Number six, the Great Irish Famine. The Great Irish Famine took out many, many people. Back in 1845, potato crop that a lot of the Irish population relied on were suddenly no longer available. See, a group of microorganisms wiped them out, and in result, around one million folks died or had to leave. Now, it was draconian law and British ruling at this point that made the exported food hard to reach people. That's where things stopped. This famine led to Irish independence, of course, and anti-union movements. And the show Victoria pulled back zero punches in 2017, where an episode showed the true happenings behind the Great Irish Famine and the role that Queen Victoria played in coming to the aid of her then subjects. It was the death of at least one million people. This was a very dark seven years in Irish history. Historian Christine Keenley spoke out and says, quote, there is no evidence that she had any real compassion for the Irish people in any way. Yikes. That's a historian saying that. That's, that's, that's how you know. Number five, Meghan Markle, solo strut. Okay, back in May 2018, we all set our alarms, we woke up early, and we all watched the royal wedding, right? We sipped our tea in our pajamas and we pretended like we were there, right? Just watching along with the other billions of people online. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle, his new duchess. At the historic wedding, Thomas Markle was just a no-show. Yeah, Meghan has walked down that aisle by herself in front of a billion people watching at home or streaming it, and it was thought at the time that this was because of Thomas's health. See, right before the wedding, Thomas suffered a heart attack, right? Just days before, so of course nobody was upset. It was almost expected for him not to show up. But cut to a year later, we began talking again. Thomas and the Duchess are now not close, it seems. Thomas even spoke out against his own daughter at one point. There was a huge scandal where Meghan even spoke to Oprah, like Oprah and that big tell-all. And Meghan actually said to her father, if you tell me the truth about working with paparazzi, we can help. And he wasn't able to do that, and for me, has really resonated, especially now as a mother, end quote. So yeah, they're not talking, I guess, anymore. Which, more than fair. If my dad was working with the paparazzi, showing them private letters, I'd be a little f***ed too. There's no way though, the guy can't even unlock his email, let alone sending one, no way. Number four, Prince Charles and Princess Diana's divorce. Prince Charles, the oldest son of the queen, straight up admitted to having an affair with Camilla Parker before his divorce from his first wife, of course, Princess Diana. Imagine having a, like, this is crazy, a princess? You cheated on a princess? That's insane. So in turn, Princess Diana addressed the relationship and what's happening during, you know, that famous 1995 interview with BBC. She couldn't have said it better, if I'm being honest. Diana said herself, quote, well, there's three of us in this marriage, so it was a bit crowded. Yeah, end quote. There's no better way of putting it, I think. That's a pretty, it's a pretty baller way of saying it. I don't know. I haven't said baller in like 13 years, but I'm like, you know what? That's a baller move. It's pretty gangster. Diana also said she was in love with riding instructor Major James Hewitt during her marriage to Charles, so everybody was busy looking other directions, it seems. Diana and Charles divorced in 1996, only one year before her tragic car accident. Now, later in 2005, Charles ended up marrying Camilla. Has anyone seen Spencer? Kristen Stewart looked great in that movie, and now I wanna watch it. Is it worth the watch? Let me know in the comments. I didn't see you go to theaters or anything. It kinda of snuck by me while I was sleeping on all the good ones. Number three, Prince Harry costume party. YouTube isn't a fan of some words, specifically one word that rhymes with Yahtzee, and it goes deep with history, as you could assume what I'm talking about. But with this being one of the biggest scandals, I have to bring it up, right? The Duke was always referred to as a bad boy, right? He was the bad royal, the bad boyo royal. I don't know, I'm trying new shit here. But just how deep did these incidents cut? Well, before he settled down with Meghan in 2018, Harry had to issue a public apology back in 2005, because, uh, whoops, somebody got photos from a costume party, and, a uh, few of them were in poor taste. Did the royal dress up as the beast from Beauty and the Beast? No, no he did not. Did he dress up like a witch? Like a little witch, uh, maybe with a, with a nice witch broom? No, none of that either. No, photos leaked of him wearing World War II German soldier gear. Yeah, I can't say too much, but it was even equipped with 
an armband, a very bad armband. Again, I can't say too much, you know, nor will YouTube allow us to show too much, but you understand what I'm trying to say. You remember. It was poor taste. He could have dressed up in any way he wanted. He's a literal prince. And he does this. It's off-putting. Harry said afterwards, and I quote, I am very sorry if I caused any offense or embarrassment to anyone. It was a poor choice of costume and I apologize. End quote. Nice, right from the heart, that's good. Really goes deep with the royal history. We love it. Number two, Vegas getaway. Nice, roll those dice. It's one thing to party like a rock star, but to party like a prince? What does that even mean? I gotta keep this Prince Harry train going because, well, now I'm mad at him, but there's even more photos from history that show what was really going down in the royal family, you know? His priorities dare I say. After that party incident, just seven years later, scandalous photos emerged from Harry's Las Vegas trip. Yeah, I had a little boys night it seems. It turns out what happens in Vegas may just leak online for your entire family to see and your grandmother. That's probably not a great time. These scandalous pics were taken during a strip pool game. Lovely, we like that. Make sure you call the right pocket while you're not wearing any. The scandal actually prompted St. James Palace to contact the Press Complaints Commission before the snaps even made their way to British tabloids. Yeah, they knew right off the bat they were fucked. They're like, uh, can we call them? Can we send a pigeon? What's the fastest? And finally, number one, Boy Jones and other attempts. Okay, being the queen and all in history, a security team is always needed, obviously. And during her reign, specifically Queen Victoria, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. First attack was in 1840. It was an 18 year old man named Edward Oxford and he fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, of course, afterwards, he was actually found not guilty due to, you guessed it, insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her, both also missed. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, might I add, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. Then these incidents kept occurring again in 1842, 1849, and 1872. Attempt after attempt after attempt. But then things got a little worse, and dare I say, a little bit more weird. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened there, I saved it for last because it's so, so horribly creepy. A teenager stalked the queen back in 1838 until 1841 and his name was Edward Jones. Edward Boy Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once, right? Before Assassin's Creed came out. No idea how we thought of this. Guy just knows the route in and he would break in and would hide under the queen's sofa. That was his go-to spot. Or he would sometimes just sit on her throne. And one of the worst things ever, sometimes he would go through her drawers. He would go through the queen's drawers. That's so gross. What? Like that's... That's so, that's gross. He would steal her clothes until eventually, and thankfully, he got caught. Number 10, moving in. I don't know about you guys, but when I think of Old Blighty, I think of royal prestige. London and Buckingham Palace, after all. That's what a queen needs. You gotta have a palace. Where's my palace? Although most people think of the queen living in Buckingham Palace, Queen Victoria was the first of the royal family to do so. I'm not royalty, but I wouldn't mind crashing a few days there. Nice big place, servants, probably all you can eat. And she had it good. All that's missing is Wi-Fi. Move over, your royal highness. I'm moving in. Just gotta get my collection of Sailor Moon memorabilia. Number nine, queen jeans. No, not a nice pair of royal jeans. I'm talking about DNA and hereditary jeans. I've mentioned a few times on this channel how the royal family may or may not have been uh, inbreeding. Okay, who am I kidding? There was a lot of inbreeding going on. Sisters, brothers, mothers, fathers, cousins, and of course, hey, step bro. Now, as lovely as that seems to some, unfortunately, crossing the hall to reproduce can have ill effects as inbreeding is known to have complications with birth and their offspring. Well, Queen Victoria may have been the first carrier of hemophilia B, a blood clotting disease. While not having it herself, it's thought she passed it down through royals related all throughout Europe. Tsar Nicholas II's son comes to mind. However, I feel like if we told the royals why people were contracting certain illnesses, they would still do what they want anyway. So, I'll just close the door. You guys can go ahead and do what you're gonna do. <sighs> Number eight, breaking tradition. For men in Western culture, it has been a long time of bending the knee to propose to the woman that you love, or so wish to swoon. 
Tammy Lynn, I don't got much, but I know I got this ring I found behind a Chuck E. Cheese. So what I would like to do is I Jim Bob Billy Abernathy, I'm asking for your hand in marriage. So romantic. Anyway, bad jokes aside, you'd be wrong in thinking that's how it went for old lady. When the young monarch met her cousin, Albert, the love juices were flowing. She knew she was going to have to lock him in and propose to him before he could get the chance. They were shortly married soon after, and as stated in her diaries, it seemed that the couple was truly in love, which for royals is kind of rare. Even today, it's usually men who propose to ladies, but all I'm gonna say is, ladies, I'm 300 pounds of twisted steel and sex appeal, and I put the toothpaste lid back on after brushing my teeth, so, huh? Huh? Number seven, did you miss me? Queen Victoria was a leader. She held a lot of power, and that means people sometimes got a little crazy and wanted to remove her from such power. So for Queen Victoria, it should be no surprise, however uncouth it was, but she had multiple assassination attempts on her life. A lot of which were people firing shots at her carriage for some reason with, with a pistol. I, and a lot of these attempts leading people to being declared insane. And one specific amateur who tried multiple times to end the royal and failed every time. Eight times to be specific. I feel like after the first four times when the guard saw this guy approach, it was like, oh, man, this guy again. Oh brother, this guy stinks! Anyway, all attempts and her life failed and she became the second longest reigning queen. Next to Queen Elizabeth, of course. Number six. Oh Christmas tree, oh Christmas tree. I was honestly shooketh when I learned this, but you know that thing a lot of people do around the holiday season where they get a big green tree and they like decorate it because of the holiday called like Christmas? I mean, you might have heard of it. Yeah, I've never heard of it either. Bad jokes aside, the queen and her husband may have popularized the Christmas tradition of decorating the tree after sending trees to local schools and army barracks. An image of the family decorating the tree was also published that Christmas. I wonder if they popularized any other traditions as well, like your aunt drinking too much wine, and that one uncle, no matter how many times he's told, says something at the dinner table that would have him sitting in HR so fast that, well, he'd, he'd be sitting in the HR office for saying something like that in public. Everyone's got an uncle like that. Number five. The Terror of London. If you're into serial killers and just a little goth or emo, I mean, who isn't, then you know who Jack the Ripper is. If you don't, he was a serial killer who roamed the streets of Victorian England and killed multiple women of the evening, and what can be called the first, or one of the first, modern serial killers. Jack the Ripper, however, is one of the psychos who got away. No one is 100% sure on who the Terror of London was. However, that hasn't stopped people from theorizing on his or her true identity. No, not Queen Victoria herself. Although, there are some who believe he was a woman, which would explain how he got away so easily. However, another popular theory is that it was the Queen Victoria's grandson, Prince Albert Victor. While there isn't much evidence to support this claim, or any of the claims really, it is interesting and makes me wonder, maybe the royal was a killer? We'll never know. Number 4. Short Kings Unite! Even though I'm a semi-charming and moderately handsome internet host, I suffer from an illness a lot of men do. I suffer from shortness. When the Lord was making me, he just put a few extra drops of cute in the mix. <sighs> and then there was no more room for my legs to grow. I just see life from a little bit down below. Although, I own it, and thank God I don't have little man syndrome. All toxic jokes aside, Queen Victoria may have been a good fit for us short kings, as she was barely five feet tall. She's known for being a formidable queen, but when you're that short, it can sometimes be difficult to keep your stature. Somebody take me seriously. Number three, dollies. Okay, so maybe my Sailor Moon merch collection is weird. Maybe I just want to be a cute blonde Japanese girl with a short skirt fighting evil. <laughs> Can you blame me? However, something I always find strange, no matter who it is and who owns it, is a doll collection. Why? Why? And it's never a couple. It's always a large collection. And tell me why anytime you go to visit someone and stay overnight, they always put you in a guest room when the majority of the dolls reside. There's nothing like a hundred pair of creepy plastic eyes staring you down when you're trying to sleep in a bed that isn't yours. Well, Her Royal Majesty had her own collection of dolls. Yeah, that's right. You can just imagine the kind of treatment these dolls received. It's said she had hundreds of them, and most likely wore higher quality clothes than most common folk at the time. Great, now my worst nightmares outnumber me, and they're dressed to the nines. Whew, dolls are just creepy. Number two, here comes the bride. Imagine being so powerful, so mighty, 
and influential that you create two Western traditions. Sure, the Christmas tree is great, but I'd argue the white wedding dress is more. She wasn't the first to wear a white wedding dress, but she was the one that made it happen. There's a few reasons why, and the obvious one is flexing that royal coin, but imagine trying to keep pure white clothes clean in the past. My mom makes a mean spaghetti and meatballs. And I have a difficult time keeping those stains off my white t-shirts, which if you also ask my mom is a bad color for me. I was a messy kid. That's why other colors at the time made sense. After all, there's no dry cleaning in the 1800s, at least not with modern machines and stain remover. Hey Alexa, can you add stain remover to my list? Number one, send lewds. Despite being known as a somewhat prudent queen, apparently the queen had an eye for the art that was lewd. In one case, the royal husband and wife gave each other art. She got some nice work, and uh, he got some nice works, if you catch my drift. We all know how nudity and lewd imagery can be treated by those who wish to censor it. Queen Victoria felt the opposite and had somewhat of an appreciation for the human form, even commissioning a lewd painting of herself. At least lewd for the time, it was more like a wrist and ankles kind of thing, but you know. Number 10, Bonnie and Clyde. It probably doesn't get any more infamous and more literal than a crime family when talking about Bonnie and Clyde. They were married, they were husband and wife, makes sense. Part of the gangster era in the 1930s America, Bonnie and Clyde were some of the worst crooks you could come across. Responsible for jailbreaks, bank robberies, unaliving police, and just looking nasty while doing it. A real sweet couple. Their days of crime came to an end when police finally caught up with a young dangerous couple and welcomed them with a barrage of bullets. Bonnie and Clyde were not great actors, but after that they did a great Swiss cheese impression. Fought the law, and the law won. Number 9, The Winter Hill Gang. One of the most successful organized crime groups in American history, the Winter Hill Gang was actually a team of a bunch of Boston area crime groups. The Irish American group ran around all over Goodwill Hunting Stopping Ground and were best known for fixing horse races. The gang was famously taken over by James J. Whitey Bulger, who is just an absolutely lovely person. We should just tell them to go watch that movie with Johnny Depp. What's it called? That movie, you know, it's that one. Yeah. I don't remember what it's called. Apparently he does a really good job. The gang disbanded in the late 90s-ish, or at least as far as I know. Number 8, Lucchese Family. This is a list of the worst and most dishonorable families, so there was a good chance that La Cosa Nostra was going to show up here. Organized crime is nothing new in America. Cities like New York and Chicago have a beautiful Italian American culture, but also the Mafia. Don't forget, they're, they're there too. One such is the Lucchese family. The same one featured in Goodfellas. Now go see that movie. That's a classic. I know the title of that one. Go see that one. It's a good one. The family was responsible for enough crimes to make the rap sheet wrap around your head twice. Most famously, however, was the Lufthansa heist. A heist at JFK Airport back in 1978, stealing an estimated $5.7 million. Now remember, keep your mouth shut and never rat on your friends. Number 7, Kimura. Everyone always talks about Italian American families, but never forget about the motherland. One, because they are still around to hurl meatballs at you, if you do, and two, the meatballs they toss to you are the kind you ain't coming back from. The most successful of the Italian mob families, the Camorra has been around since back in the 19th century, just like awkward first dates. In modern times, they pull in around $4.9 billion per year from all kinds of illegal enterprises, from trafficking firearms to extortion. They got their start offering protection services in the 1800s during Italy's violent political struggles, and they've been killing it ever since. It's kind of a bad joke. Number six, the Jesse James Gang. The real life wild wild west bank robber, the man, the myth, the literal legend Jesse James. Every cowboy stereotype fits here. Facial hair? Check. Rough and rugged persona? Check. Robbing and looting with your favorite pair of six shooters? Checkerino. <laughs> That's right, neighbor. No stagecoach was safe. No lady and her baubles were safe. That was until a man named Robert Ford shot Jesse James. However, I'm of the notion that just because you shot Jesse James, that don't make you Jesse James. Hence why I didn't know who Robert Ford was until I made a very savvy Google search. But we've all heard of Jesse James, though, haven't we? Hmm, strange how that works. Number five, the Medellin Cartel. You ever seen Narcos? Okay, then. Moving on to the next point. I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Pablo Escobar, Colombia. The Medellin cartel was a joint operation between multiple different Colombian traffickers and was in business from 1972 to 1993 in a huge amount of territory. Colombia, Panama, California, New York, Florida, Peru, the Bahamas, 
Canada. They were moving literal tons of snow each year at the height of the operation, making around 60 million US dollars a day. A day. It became political in its later years, and becoming political always ruins pretty much everything, so. Number four, Hell's Angels. As a large white dude, there's something that happens to us when we reach middle age. We get bigger, the bellies hang a little lower, hair grows silver and thinner, our skin begins to darken from years of neglect and binge drinking in the sun while tanning with cigarettes. Yes, that's right, it's time to buy a motorcycle, says a little voice in our heads. What? No, I'm not going through a midlife crisis. This is something said by all Hells Angels members, or your dad, or your uncle, at one point. Despite being a fun weekend club for dads and uncles to ride bikes and all the good stuff they do, the club sadly has more police investigations than a nefarious motorcycle club that has ulterior motives. Yeah, it's not good. It's not all good stuff. Unaliving, smuggling, well, you get the point here. I'd be here all day listening to all the naughty stuff. At least I'm not insecure about my aging, though. I wonder how much a Corvette is. Number three, the Chicago Outfit. The Chicago Outfit was founded in 1910 by Big Jim Colosimo, but its main first leaders were Johnny Torrio and none other than this one guy, you might have heard of him, Al Capone. When they first cropped up, the South Side Gang was fighting gang wars over distribution of alcohol during the Prohibition, but they moved on to bigger and better things. You know, cheerful stuff like loan sharking, illegal gambling, extortion, political corruption, and that kind of wholesome activity. The outfit has been one of the most powerful, violent, and largest unified criminal organizations in the Midwest of the US. Number two, oil baron. John D. Rockefeller, the richest American, the CEO, CEO. The owner of Standard Oil, but more importantly, the first oil baron, and really the first man to own a monopoly on the oil industry. Yeah, that's right, I'm throwing a little corporate crime your way. I was gonna put Adam on the list here as a joke, but he didn't want me to bring up his jail time. Hey! Nah, I'm just kidding, he didn't go to jail, but he should be arrested though, for being so gosh darn cute, right? Anyways, all joking aside, John D. Rockefeller's wealth was impressive. Today, with inflation, it would sit somewhere in the hundreds of billions. My God. Yes, the family still has the wealth, and no, sadly, I'm not related. Why I bring him up is because laws were created after this manipulation of the oil industry and the reasons for his absurd wealth. that They were created because of him. That's insane. Dude's got a whole square in New York. I can't even afford a closet at those prices. Oh man, someone adopted me. Number one, the Cray Twins. Reggie and Ronnie Cray. It's the Cray Twins, isn't it? These identical twin brothers were the heads of crime in the east end of London, England in the 1950s and most of the 1960s. They were intermingled with politicians and entertainers through their nightclubs. People like Frank Sinatra and Judy Garland. With friends like that, you're bound to be a celebrity yourself. That doesn't seem helpful though when it comes to being a criminal though, especially when one of you is literally insane. The Cray Twins ran the organization known as The Firm, which was involved in crimes like armed robbery, arson, protection rackets, and assault. All the stuff that Andrew does in his spare time. Hey! I am being held against my will. Please call the authorities. <laughs> Just kidding. He's great. He's great. He's great. 